Okay, so the question was a, a beer with a deceased scientist, and you get, you also give the opportunity to get them up to speed on where insect population stands or the newest surveillance technologies that, you know, where the, where the field stands, who would that be? And what would you talk about? <laughs> that's well, I, there's two spring to mind. Can I have two? Yeah, two, two is good. Take five. The, the, five. <laughs> <laughs> the first one was probably chosen by half your other guests, which would be Darwin. Of course, uh, which is of course. Predictable. But, but for the very good reason that he was, a, he really loved bumblebees. Um, you know, he, he discovered loads of things about bumblebees for the first time, um, I mean, including one of his more famous things was he, um, uh, he, he studied the, the way male bumblebees do this weird kind of patrolling to attract mates. They, they mark out as kind of root. And then a whole gang of them race round and round and round it in circles all day long. Um, <laughs> and he got his kids to, to, to sort of stand at different points on the route and shout when they saw the bee going past. <laughs> <laughs> they, they sprinkled sprinkled flour. They, they used little sugar shakers and sprinkled flour onto the bees, so they looked like kind of ghost bees. Them. So they were huh. easier to see, oh, and all funny. sorts of crazy stuff. Um, so yeah, and, and uh, you know, he'd probably be horrified by the state of the, the mm-hmm. insects today, sadly, because yeah. obviously things were, you know, you read accounts. Well, so the other person I'd choose uh, lived really close to Darwin, um, but a little bit later, there's a guy called William Sladen. Mm-hmm who no one's ever heard of, but he was kind of the, the first person to study bumblebees. And he wrote a book, the first ever book about bumblebees called The Humblebee. Because uh, <laughs> interestingly, bumblebees used to be called humblebees and then they, they, they became bumblebees about a hundred years ago. Nobody really knows why, but anyway, huh, that's another, huh, I didn't know that. <laughs> another, another story. Um, but he, he talks about, uh, you know, he describes as familiar garden insects, species which are extremely rare or extinct today. Um, and and it would be really nice to pick his brains about. So I mean, obviously, I'm a bit of a bumblebee fanatic. That's my main core research interest. And to be able to talk to someone who knew these really rare species when they were common would mm-hmm. would be pretty amazing. You know, he 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 found the nests and he reared them in his shed. And he, even when he was a uh, he started this when he was a kid. He was a kind of a child prodigy. Um, he wrote he wrote a little book about bumblebees when he was 16. Um, Mm -hmm. at a time when nobody knew anything about them at all he just you know kind of acquired this knowledge somehow anyway though i go for those so they both lived in kent in the southeast of england um (laughs) oddly (laughs) enough a hot spot what do you what do you think they'd be saying today about the state of insects i mean would they how surprised would they be i guess they would be surprised but how surprised would they be about the declines that we're seeing now well i i guess it's interesting because Conservation just wasn't an issue in their day. Right. You know, S- Sladen was around in the early 20th century. Um, and, and really, it hadn't occurred to people to really worry, I don't think at that stage in history, to, to worry that species might disappear or you know, that there was any problem with us over-exploiting the, the planet. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I, it would be a com- complete news to them. It's not something I don't think they would have predicted or expected. I, and obviously, I guess they'd be rather depressed. You know, it would yeah. be a strange thing if they could, if they could see us today, and you know, they they would immediately see how how profoundly different the landscape is now to what it was a hundred years ago. Um, mm-hmm. And that's something that we obviously we can't easily appreciate because we've just grown up with with the landscape we have around us. And although it has been changing during our lifetime, because it's it's a slow process. Um, it's, yeah, sort it, of creeping, it, it, creeping expectations by people and by society shift, about what constitutes normal, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. shifting baselines. You know, yeah, we're, we're yeah. and I came across there was, a, there was an interesting paper in um, I saw the other day where they show these aerial photographs of a bit of French countryside. And the first was taken in uh, 1950, and the and then it was four of them about 15, 20 years apart up to the present day, and it was just amazing how. Today, you know, big fields, um, not quite as big as you have in parts of North America, but, but you know, 50 hectare fields or whatever. Mm-hmm. In, 19, in 1958, when the first photograph was taken, the, the landscape was, was composed of hundreds of tiny little fields, you know, mm. like this kind of colourful patchwork of little, little fields. And it's all just been swept, swept away mm-hmm. in, in, you know, a single human's lifetime. But nobody mm-hmm. really notices it, you mm-hmm. know, that's... And that kind of fascinating yeah slightly yeah. worrying super interesting mm.